Uh, welcome to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Uh, today we have a very special guest, uh, legendary coach and innovator and uh, founder of the Air Raid Offense, uh, Coach Halmumi. Coach, how are you doing? Good, Nick. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic, Coach. Um, looking forward to the Super Bowl this evening um, and just having we get you on and talk a little ball. Um I, I kind of want to – I'm just going to jump right into it because I have about a, a billion questions on my mind with limited time. Um, I, I, I'll i start with this. I, I've heard um, that you've said it took about five years for your, for you guys to kind of develop the air raid offense. I, I, I forget what interview I was listening to. Uh, you said it took about five years to develop it. What? Why did it take so long with, to develop – to get to where you wanted it to be, and what were kind of hiccups you saw along the way? We um, we started it on the high school level in, at Coppers Cove, Texas. And basically, I was just trying to copy everything Lavelle Edwards did. And that's what I was doing. And, and so uh, that was three years. And we... I would make these constant trips out to BYU and, and, uh, I had started copying them when I was the offensive coordinator at UTEP. And the last year I was there, we got fortunate and we beat them. They were the number, number one team in the nation. And they came to El Paso and we were like 30 point underdogs and we managed to, uh, upset them. But we upset them doing uh, basically what now is called several of the big plays were what now we everybody calls back shoulders. Yeah. And I had seen them do that to Boston College early in the year and beat them. And I watched that film and watched it and watched it. And I'd put in some of their base plays like Mesh and Y Sale and Y Cross. Uh, Anyway, in that game, we had two or three really huge third down conversions doing that. So after the season was over, we all got fired and I was looking for a job and I knew I wanted to go be a head coach because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. (laughs) And I didn't want anybody telling me, I didn't care where it was. I just want to be the head guy because I knew what offense I wanted to run. I, I had these ideas in my head and, uh, one of the BYU coaches came up to me at the AFCA convention and he said, what are you going to do now? Why don't you come interview for our quarterback job? Cause Mike Holmgren just left to go to the 49ers. Well, I was flattered by that, but I had little kids and you know, we're Catholic. I like to drink bourbon, smoke cigars. <laughs> that wasn't going to fit in too good in Provo, Utah. So the, uh, I said, I appreciate it, but I really want to be the head guy. I'm trying, I'm trying to get some, a couple of small college jobs, maybe a high school job. And he goes, well, coach Edwards will help you any way you want. Because he said, he told us after that game that we've lost some games before, but we've never lost a game to a team we should beat doing what we do. (laughs) And he said, you're always welcome. So that started a probably 10 year trek to Provo, Utah, from wherever I was a couple of times a year. I actually watched every football game, every offensive side of of every football game Lavelle Edwards coached as the head coach at BYU. And it it got so, (laughs) I got so familiar with these guys, I bugged them so much that uh, when I, after three or four years, when I would get there, uh, Coach Edwards' secretary, Cheryl, would hand me a key and say, look, just lock up when you leave. Because <laughs> she knew I was going to sit in that film room until 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I would go up in the spring, you know, pick out what I wanted to put in at my team, which started out at Copper's Cove, and then eventually Iowa Wesleyan. And then uh, I'd go back in the summer. I usually take my son, Matthew, to go to their camp and and – go back and pester him with questions about what I just installed, you know? (laughs) And so I I think it paid dividends because I only did, I mean, I studied the run and shoot a lot and I incorporated some of that, 
I studied Bill Walsh's way, and Coach Walsh was always a mentor and, and a friend, too. Uh, was always very open with me. What I got from him, besides plays, we, we a few plays, but we, we kind of put our spin on them. But what I really got from him was learning to plan practice and plan games and how we call it. So, so the game planning and practice planning came from Bill Walsh. The basic offense came from BYU. And, and some of the uh, little wrinkles we run uh, came from Mouse Davis and June Jones and John Jenkins. Okay. And uh, we, we did it for three years at Cove, had a lot of success at a place that had never had any success. Uh, there were three schools in that district that they had never, ever beaten in their whole history. <laughs> and, and we beat all three of them in, the, in three years. And uh, turned out some good players. And, and then I got lucky, and they couldn't find a – Iowa Wesleyan was so bad that they offered it to nearly every good high school coach in the state of Iowa, and they all turned it down. Oh. So then they started – then they offered it to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I took it. And I, I got lucky in my selection of coaches. I hired Mike Leach, uh, who at the time was working at College of the Desert as a defensive coach. And it, it was he was making $6,000 a year, and he had to watch the rec gym at night. And so I offered him $12,000 a year to be the O-line coach. And he was like the only guy I could hire that would actually get a raise by coming there. <laughs> and... And uh, really, you know, just I could tell when I first interviewed him, he was really smart. I, I tried to hire some of my friends that were O-line coaches. And in, in 1989, if you, if you told an offensive line coach that you're going to have big splits, play out of a two-point stance, and we're going to throw the ball 50 times a game, they would get up and walk out of the room on you. <laughs> you know, you weren't going to hire an O-line coach to do that in 1989. So what I decided to do was just hire the smartest guy I could find and teach him what I wanted. Good choice. And that was Leach. And, and Mike Leach is the guy who developed all of our techniques, drills, and fundamentals for the way we play football in the air raid, in, in the O-line. So he was the best O-line coach I've ever had, and I've had some good ones. Um, but anyway, going back to the how to take five years, it took three at Carver's Cove, just experimenting. Then we went to Iowa Wesleyan. It took two more there. The fourth year, the second year at Wesleyan, we put in the, the shotgun. And the third year, we had gotten, so they had won six games and 10 games in six years when I got there. And they had not won a game in two years. <laughs> so they were pretty bad. They were NAIA, they had bad facilities. Uh, Nice town. Mount Pleasant's a really nice town. But old college. Been there 140 years at that point. Little bitty school. Had about 500 students. And uh, they just wanted to win some games, you know. And so we put this in and we started winning games. And the first year we won seven and the second year we won eight. And by the time we were going into the third year, nobody in those little private liberal arts colleges would play us anymore. So we started having to play up. <laughs> we played Wayne State, and we played Northeast Missouri, and we played uh, Missouri S&T, and we played, uh, you know, a lot of what are D2 or FCS schools now, Portland State, Morningside. Um, we were independent so we had to you know we had to pick and choose our schedule well, hell we were we were playing guys that we were playing teams that we had we had 500 to 800 students there or something like that and we're playing schools that got 8,000 students and uh, a big budget so I told Mike I said we got our we got our quarterback back we got all we got the whole offensive team back most of the defense we won We've won 15 games in two years. We've won two bowl. We've been to two bowls, and we might be lucky to win three games this year because <laughs> the schedule was just so difficult. And I said we need an edge, so we started doing like Mike and I always did. We got in our car and started studying stuff, and that's why I say it took it took five years because what what we landed on was. 
I told you it was it was February and it was cold, and <laughs> I didn't like being cold. Neither did Mike. I said, find us somebody in Florida to recruit. <laughs> and Mike being Mike, he finds a kicker in Key West. <laughs> so I went over and made an excuse to the president that we needed two airline tickets. And the president says, well, okay, I'll give them to you, but I, I can't fly you. You, you, you. We can't go to Key West. He, uh, he comes back and he gives me enough money to buy two tickets to Orlando, which then we had to rent a car and drive to Key West, which is like nine hours. You know? <laughs> And, uh, but it was, it was Providence was watching over us because on the flight in, Mike says, Hey, you know, they got that spring league going on and the old line coach for the Orlando team is a friend of mine. You want to go by and visit? I go, yeah, call him as soon as we get off the plane. So he calls him up and they were real nice. And they said, yeah, come on by. And Don Matthews, the famous guy that won like six gray cups in Canada was the head coach. And Bill McDermott was Mike's friend, who was the old line coach. And we went, we spent the whole day with them. And they were really great. They let us sit on all the team meetings and watch film. And then we're walking out to practice there at the uh, Citrus Bowl. And uh, I looked at Coach Matthews and I said, what's your best drill? Tell me what you, you do best. And he said, well, watch the bandit drill at the end. That's what we do best. I said, okay. He goes, that's where we practice our two-minute offense. So now I'd seen people practice two-minute offenses before, but I'd never seen one so well organized and so well done. I mean, they had they had the ball spotted before the other play was already was even finished, you know, and yeah. guys were catching the ball and running the score, and the defense was pursuing, and the offense was on one side of the field, and the defense was on the other, and they were subbing it just like it was a game. And, and – uh, it was just really well done. And I looked at Mike and I said, that's our edge. And I said, but we're not going to do it for two minutes. We're going to do it the whole game. So we, we went back, made some notes, wrote some stuff down, went back to Wesley. And after we actually got the kicker in Key West, <laughs> <laughs> we had a grand time. We, we signed up for about 20 players while we were down there there and go. we went deep sea fishing and, and uh, hung out at, uh, for the first time ever, Mike Leach and I went to Captain Tony's in Key West. Okay. And, and I got tired about 2 o'clock in the morning and went back to the hotel. And I woke up the next morning. I got Leach up for breakfast. And we're sitting there, and he goes, well, you screwed up. You shouldn't have left. I go, why is that? He goes, guess who sat down next to me after you left in your chair? I go, who? He goes, Captain Tony. <laughs> If you're a Buffett fan, you know what I'm talking about. So, so Buffett wrote this this great song called "Last Last Time Last Mango in Paris." Yeah. And uh, and uh, Captain Tony's the the what the song's about. This this famous guy who eventually became mayor of Key West at one point, and he and he owned that bar, Captain Tony's. Yeah. But he he was this adventurer and pirate and just a great character, but. Leach got to talk to him for like two hours. You know, That's he awesome. told him the whole story about how Buffett wrote the song and everything too. Uh, <laughs> and now, if you go down there, Mike actually has his own bar stool at Captain Tony's. They put names. The famous people get their names put on bar stools at Captain Tony's, and they put they they gave Mike a bar stool. <laughs> he called me up in about two thousand. I think it was about two thousand when he was out of coaching a couple of years. He called me up one night. It was after we. It was I tell you what. It was two thousand eleven because we had beaten. Uh, we had, I was at McMurray and we beat UTSA. Okay. It's the only time in history a Division three schools beat a Division one school, in uh, or at least a fully funded one. Um, and so about, I get back home and about midnight, the phone rings. And it's Mike, and he goes, "I'm going to send you a picture." He said, "You're going to be so jealous." <laughs> I said, why? He said, well, I really called to congratulate you on the win, but really, really, I just called to piss you off. <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> he sends me this picture. He texts me this picture. It's got his bar stool with his name on it. He goes, I got a bar stool at Captain Tony's. <laughs> so anyway, that all is a, it was a result of that first trip in 1990 or 1991, early 91. So we go back to Wesley and we put in the, we put in the no huddle. 
Dustin D. Waller, great quarterback there, the first air raid quarterback. Goes through the spring with it. Get through the end of the spring. I said, how do you like doing that? And he goes, everybody hates it. I said, what do you mean everybody hates it? And he goes, everybody hates it. <laughs> and I hate it. I said, why do you hate it? And he goes, well, it's just too cumbersome. Like, it takes too long to figure out what to run. And uh, I said, well, look, do me a favor. We'll come back in two days. Give me one week. And I'll, I'll pare it down. I'll, I'll, I'll narrow the menu for you. Okay. So I spent all summer trying to figure out what was totally essential and what, what had to disappear. Yeah. And so I pared the playbook down to what every, most people think it's eight plays. Uh, it's really kind of like more like, I guess, eight concepts. They, those plays can morph into about 20 different things, yeah. but, but it's basically eight plays. And I told Dustin, here's, here's, here's the plays you can pick from. And if you don't get one, just look at me and I'll call it for you from the sidelines. And if you're ever in trouble, just run bench. Yeah. So we go through the first week in, in the fall camp. We got to play Northeast Missouri, which is now called Truman State. But we're an NAI school who's not ranked. They're a, the number 10 team in Division Two, so they're a level above us. And they've got the reigning Harlan Hill finalists back. They've got a bunch of great players. So when the guy called me for it, he couldn't find a game because nobody wanted to play him. And we were the same way. Nobody wanted to play us. The schools were only 90 miles apart. So I told him, well, I'll play you, but you got to come to us first. I need a home game. So he agreed. So we have this game. And we're going in the sea. We're like 30-point underdogs. And, and uh, But we've gone through that fall camp. And after that first week, I called Dusty and I said, so do you want to keep it or drop it? He goes, oh, everybody loves it now. So we're going to keep it. <laughs> okay. So we go out to this first game. And we didn't play very well. We, we had a great opening drive. We drove right down the field and scored on. And then we, I don't know, we fumbled a punt. We did, we did a bunch of bonehead things. And at halftime, I'm walking into the locker room, and we're down 24 to 7. And I'm kind of thinking... Well, 48 to 14 looks pretty bad. And I'm an idiot. I could have played this game on the road and nobody would even see it. <laughs> I, I got 3,000 people here. You know, people started coming to Wesleyan games because they were fun to watch. Yeah. And uh, when we first got there, you know, we played in front of family and friends. But by the third year, people were, we had a packed house, you know. And uh, <laughs> I'm sitting there going, boy, this is going to be embarrassing. What am I going to say to him? So I, I'm, I'm walking to the to the locker room door, and and D. Wall comes up to me, pats me on the back, says, "You know, I'm saying thing. We're going to win this game." And I'm thinking, he's not watching the same game I'm watching. <laughs> and then our big left tackle, Sean Martin, comes up to me, puts his arm around my shoulder, and says, "Don't worry, coach. We're going to win this game." And that's the only complete sentence Sean Martin ever said to me in three years. <laughs> And he said it with a lot of a lot of uh, confidence, and so I'm look. I'm thinking, scratching my head, and I'm looking at these guys. And I go in the locker room, and I'm looking around. You know how when you go in the locker room, and guys, if you're getting your ass kicked, usually they're down there, they're throwing stuff, or they've yeah. got their heads low. Or they, these guys were acting like they were ahead twenty four to seven. Okay. And so I was saying anything to them. and they came back out, and we proceeded to beat these guys thirty four to thirty one. D wall threw for 400 and something yards and four touchdowns. And, and, uh, yeah, in fact, we, we got, we got on them so fast. They, they kind of closed the gap at the end. They scored a late touchdown. And so the game ended up closer than it really was. Okay. Um, and boy, it was just, we, we knew we had, we were onto something, yeah. you know, so we, we went on to win 10 games that year. The only game we lost was to, we were ranked number five and we lost to, uh, we lost to Harding, who was number four yeah. in the nation. And we lost a, a, right at the end of the game. It was a, it was a terrific game, but that, that's the game where D-Wall threw it. Uh, 
He threw it 86 times and completed 61 of them. Ooh, there you go. And uh, it was it was a terrific game, but we we did lose that one. But then we made the we made the NAI playoffs. It's still the only time in history that 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 little school's been to the playoffs. And uh, and then I took the job at Valdosta and went down there and we re redid the offense uh, with a new group of kids and had the you know equal amounts of success over five years. Had two quarterbacks who were Harlan Hill. Had one win the Harlan Hill and the other one was runner up. Um, and and uh, then I got the job at Kentucky. But when I say five years, it took us to that third season at Wesleyan. Yeah. To, to play fast, you know. What most people think of air raid offense nowadays is spread formation, shotgun, and and playing fast, you know, yeah. and and big line splits. Uh, that's what most people would, most coaches would say if you if you ask them what's an air raid offense, you know. And uh, a lot of people in general just say spread, which is has never really been true. No. <laughs> but the uh, uh, but anyway, that's why I say five years. That's a long answer to the question. No, that's, that's perfect, right. Coach. That's that's perfect. Um, but I, you mentioned a couple things in there. Obviously, you mentioned Coach Leach and Valdosta State, and I, I kind of because you had a very good staff. You've had a bunch of good staffs. I'm not I'm not going to just narrow it down to them. But Valdosta State, especially. I mean, you you break down that staff. You've had a lot of f- former assistants, not only become successful head coaches, but successful coordinators, successful position coaches. Why do you think your assistants, your former assistants, have done so well for themselves overall in the coaching ranks? Well, because they love the offense, and and they most of them stay pretty true to it. You know, yeah. everybody puts and when you get a head job, everybody puts their own spin on things. You know, but but all those guys uh, that were with it, they were they a lot of them. Bill Beatonball was our center at Iowa Wesley, and now he's the best one of the best O line coaches in America at OU. Yeah. Um, certainly one of the highest paid uh, <laughs> Dana Holgerson was our starting flanker at Iowa Wesleyan both those guys came to Valdosta and coached for me for a couple of years uh, Dana went on and Dana stayed two years and we played for the national championship his last year there and then uh, he went to be a coordinator at a smaller school yeah and then uh, Bill actually went with us to Kentucky as a kind of off the field guy and then left there and went, got a position job coaching the O line at one of the Michigan schools. And then, uh, you know, Leach hired a lot of those guys back when he got the job at Texas tech. And so he had a lot to do with their careers too. Uh, certainly, um, Sonny Dykes joined us at Kentucky and he was, his dad spike had always been one of my mentors. And, and so I wanted to help Sonny out like his dad had always helped me. And uh, so I got him, came up to Kentucky. Uh, Chris Hatcher was our quarterback at Valdosta, the first one, and won the Harlan Hilton Trophy, and now he's the head coach at Samford in Birmingham. Uh, his his line coach is Sean Bostic, who was his center at Valdosta State. Yeah. And uh, a great old line coach, not as well known as some of the others because he's always just stayed with Hatcher, you know. Um. But, uh, yeah, they, those guys – but I, I think the, the bottom line is is the way we play football is fun to play and, and the players get addicted to it and the, the coaches get addicted to it and they don't want to do anything else. <laughs> and fortunately for me, uh, a lot of those guys have landed good jobs, you know. Yeah. Neil Brown at West Virginia and, and a lot of these guys that played, played in this offense – you know, rose through the ranks pretty high, pretty fast as coordinators, and uh, and then got head head coaching jobs. Yeah, um, and then kind of continue with that. You, I mean, you've you've mentioned everybody puts their little spin on it. And you've also mentioned that anybody that sees a two by two or three by one set just calls it offense air raid when it isn't. Um, what is your? I mean, obviously you de- developed the air raid certification, which I'll put a link below uh, for anybody that I, wants to check that out. Yeah. Um, but in your opinion, what are your thoughts on how the how the offense has evolved over the years? And then, um, if how do I want to word this? Um, on top of that, um, how do you narrow? 
I, what, 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 from somebody who thinks their offense is air raid but isn't, what is, what is the air raid offense in, in your view, in your blatant view? Well, um, that's two questions. I'm going to answer the first one, uh, how it's evolved. And the biggest evolution was done by Dana Holgerson. And when Dana left Mike to go be the coordinator for Kevin Sumlin at the University of Houston, and they had uh, they had a great quarterback there, and he was uh, he was really good with his eyes and his feet. And I'll think of his name in a second. I've kind of it's kind of escaped me. But I was at McMurray. And before Dana did this, our run game was just basically the draw and whatever else we thought our running back could run well, you know? Yeah. And so we would, at times, we ran the hand sweep, we ran counter tray, we ran uh, ISO, of course, inside zone, uh, outside zone. I mean, it was just kind of a, the, 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 the run game was just kind of a grab bag of, two or three plays, you know? Yeah. But Dana went and he, he goes to Houston and he puts in, uh, he puts in the inside zone and started throwing the screens off of it. Okay. And then he started throwing the uh, stick routes off of it. And then he developed some other stuff. So basically what he, what everybody calls RPOs today yeah. was, was what, Everybody was kind of running inside zone, like Rich Rodriguez had made inside zone real popular. Yeah. Well, Dana took the inside zone and turned it into a read, and and then started throwing the ball off of it. And so that has probably been one of the biggest evolutions in the game, I think. And it changed our air. It, and now it gave our air raid offense a consistent run game okay. that you could teach and. He came, I remember he came by. I was at McMurray, and uh, we had started. They, that was another job I took over that hadn't won a game in two years. And and we won four the first year, and then we won six. And then Dana goes to Oklahoma State. And on his way up, he stops by and visits with me. And he says, Coach, how come you're not running running this this inside zone with the screens and stuff like we're doing? I go, well, I don't really, I like it, but I don't really understand it. So he drew it up for me and taught me how to do it. And I put it in. And then that, that was, a, again, a school that their only trip to the playoffs <laughs> came out of that. We were averaging about 70 yards a game rushing the two previous years. And when we put that in, we started averaging like 110 <laughs> and it, with the same kids, you know, so. It, it, it propelled us to the quarterfinals of the NCAA Division Three playoffs. It's also the year we beat UTSA. <laughs> um, but Dana, Dana deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, that that was probably the the number one. Ev that's the number one evolution of it. Okay? okay, and a lot of things are built off of that with a lot of people. Uh, and then, um, but as far as just you know, if I were if you run mesh, Y cross, Y sail, and four verticals, you're pretty much air raid team. You know? <laughs> well, that's four plays that we don't do. We, we won't do without. You okay. know, there, there can be other stuff, but mesh, Y cross, Y sail, four verticals. Yeah. Now, speaking of mesh, I, I, I one of my buddies wanted me to ask you is, and, and this is how he put it: is why do you prefer to run? Um, yeah, let me rephrase this. Why do you prefer to, to, to the X to run the mesh? Well, I think it's more confusing. If you look at, if you think he, if you're the weak side safety, and let's say you run it out of slot with out of four wides. Yeah. So now you've got the X coming inside. You've got the slot going to the outside, and then you got Y coming across who ends up in your vision. So I, to me, it's just more confusing to them, but I've run it both ways. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people like, I don't know, a lot of people just like the simplicity of meshing the two slot guys, but I've done that before, but I just prefer it the other way. I, you know, I, we, in the XFL, we did, we did all of them. So, yeah. I mean, I, 
they all work. <laughs> <laughs> Just call it. Now, speaking of that, because I, I, I was listening to you talk to Ron Mackey. I don't even know when that one was. But I was kind of just re-listening to that to prep for this. And you, you obviously Mesh is your favorite play. I think everybody knows that. I think that's general knowledge. Um, yeah. Four birds or six is, is kind of your second go-to. What is number yeah. – I, just because I'm always curious and I always like just going down the tree. What is the third – what is the next – next of that favorite? White Cross. White, White Cross. Cross. Okay. Yeah. And then White Seal. White Cross, then White Seal. All right. Um. And then um, before I kind of rapid fire a couple like scheme related questions, I do I do as as for me personally as an offense coordinator, and then for anybody that's a new younger offense coordinator, what advice do you have coaches trying to develop their system for their kids and for what they're trying to do? Well, I think the reason we're good everywhere we've been is because it's it, we understand reps. It's about reps. Okay. It's not about the number of plays, it's about the number of reps. So narrow down your plays and, and increase your reps. Okay. It's it's why we stop flipping the Y and the X, you know. We're a right handed offense all the time. And we did that because if you just think about it, I in the old days Leach and I would get together and I'd go, Okay, we had blue right ninety two and then we had blue left ninety two, okay, which is mesh. And I said, how many times did we, we would go by, we would go down the list of plays every year. And if it didn't average five yards, we dropped it, you know, and I'd go, well, how many times did I call 90 blue, right? 92. And he goes 150. <laughs> and I said, how many times did I called blue left 92. And he goes 12. <laughs> I said, well, we're dropping that. We're not doing that anymore. Yeah. And then in 1993, the, NCAA and the NFL decided to move the hash marks inside. Now you're in Ohio. Y'all still play with the white hash marks, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. See, in, in Texas high schools, they play with the college hash marks, yeah. but um, all the rest of them play with the white hash marks. But in 1993, the colleges moved them in to where they are now. And then the pros moved them in to a ridiculous amount to where now you're just always in the middle of the field, which is to me, the height of laziness. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <coughs> we decided to do that. Well, Guy Morris was on my staff at that point. Mm -hmm. And Guy had worked for the great Raymond Berry, the, the old Baltimore Colts receiver, but he had worked for him at New England. And uh, he came in my office. He said, hey, if we can get a couple of airline tickets, we can go visit Raymond in Denver because he wants us to come out and talk ball and he got fired at the Broncos, and so he, but they paid him, so he doesn't have to do anything for a year. So he's just going to sit around and talk football with people. I said, yeah, sure, we're there. <laughs> so we fly out to Denver. We go up there to Raymond's house. And his beautiful wife, Sally, cooks for us for two days, and we sat there at, at one of the, the greatest receiver in NFL history, one of them, and uh, talked football for two days. That's nice. And at the end of the two days, he was really intrigued with Mesh. He said this plot, this, he, and he was the first NFL guy that ever was intrigued with it, or, or at least to me, verbalized, yeah. you know, he said, this will work. And we'd taken all our cutups and he's sitting there watching. He goes, this would work in the NFL. And, and, uh, finally I popped the, the big question. I said, Raymond, I'm thinking about not flipping the tight end and that split in and just being right handed all the time. I said, do you think I can get away with that? I said, because they move the hash marks in. He goes, he said, he draws up brown right, you know? So like, like some people call it far, you know? But yeah. tight end, X, Z, and then the back split, you know, kind of like this. And he says, this was me at X. He puts his name on there. He says, this was Lenny Moore at H. And this was Alan Amici at at F and this was, uh, uh, the great John Mackey at Y and the great, uh, Jimmy or Z. He said, of course, Johnny Unitas was the quarterback and that was the Baltimore Colts. He said, I caught 500 and whatever passes from this side right here. He said, we only had Brown, right? 
And he said, if we wanted to get fancy, we would call Brown Flip, and then Jimmy Orr would move over in the slot. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, and I would go, Raven said, I would go to SMU every June and run all my routes and get them filmed. And I would have three ways to run every route. And I ran them all from the left side. And so I had every, all three ways were choreographed. I knew Johnny knew exactly when I hit a certain step to, to throw the ball. Yeah. And then we would get in July, he said, we'd go to Baltimore and Johnny and I would go over to this, this high school and throw and then, then we'd do all the routes and choreograph it with us, with the, with the ball. He said, and then we'd go to training camp. He said about, we, Eubanks was the coach. He said about every third year, we would get crazy and he'd come in and he'd drop Brown left. So I had to flip over to the right and Jimmy Orr had to flip over to the left and he'd go, well, you just, you know, they're getting, they're, they're getting on to us. We've got to do something different. And he said, we practice that for about two days, about four practices. And balls would be flying everywhere, you know. The steps weren't right. The ball wasn't on time. It was just bad, 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 bad. Nobody wanted to do it. He said somewhere around the second night, every single time we did this, he said Johnny would go down the hall in that dorm, knock on Weeb's door, go in there and smoke cigarettes and drink bourbon all night. And when he came out, we didn't have brown left anymore. <laughs> Oh, he said, yeah, you can get away with that. <laughs> yeah. And so we did. Chris Hatcher went from being, our goal, Leach and I, when we first started doing this, our goal was always to have a 60% passer, Yeah. you know? And after we did that in 1993, Hatcher's percentage went up 10 points. There you go. So in 1994, he said at that time was the D2 record. And it was it was the best in college football at all levels. He completed 72% of his passes. Pretty we nice. won 11 games. And our tight end was a guy named Steve Greer, who when I got to Valdosta State, they said, well, he's only here because his dad's D-line coach at Georgia. And he's, he's not big enough to be a tight end, and he's not fast enough to be a wide receiver. He's, he just, you know, the previous coach just gave him a scholarship because he worked with his dad and then Steve Greer went on to catch 150 passes in three years <laughs> and that's that last year his senior year, he caught something like 90 and so a lot of that was because he just did everything from one position yeah. you know and we had the same same luck with the the uh the split ends same deal so you, you had two spots that that they were always going to rep over and over again from one one side of the ball, and so I really think that played a key role in in the uh, in the success of our offense. Now you mentioned Mike Leach there and kind of evaluating what you guys called during the season. How detailed did you guys get with that off season eval every year? Well, until we got to Kentucky, where you had all sorts of help and. We still did it, but I mean, we didn't have to do it ourselves. Yeah. But the first, probably the first eight years, I mean, three years at Wesley and five years at Valdosta, we we did it ourselves, and uh, we would take every play, see how many times we called it, see how many. Yards. It was pretty simple. I mean, we just we wanted to make five yards on a play. If we didn't, we dropped it. Okay. And if we weren't calling it enough, we dropped it. You know. Yeah. Now, and here's where I'm going to kind of rapid fire a couple of scheme questions. A couple of guys wanted me to ask you. Um, first question is, what is it about double slant or stick flat that makes those routes stick out to you? Well, they've, they've always been, the, the double slant's always been the backside of our quick game. And we don't always double slant it. Depending on the coverage, we could go deep with the outside guy. Uh, like if, when people started playing a lot of split coverage, we, we at first it was always double slant, but then we, when we started seeing a lot of cover four, cover two, then we started releasing because we wanted to be able to hold that safety in place on the backside. Uh, but it, it's it's just the 
you know, it's a staple for the offense. Stick route. Stick route, we actually stumbled upon. It was the old uh, Bill Walsh play where they would, uh, Montana would take three steps and throw it to Brent Jones after he, he met, ran the little uh, <coughs> three step bend out, you know? Yeah. Well, our tight end, <coughs> excuse me, our tight end at, at Iowa Wesleyan, he started turning inside instead of outside. I don't know why. I think it just happened because of coverage or something. And Dewalt liked it better. And so we just started running like that instead. And it really gave more separation between the shoot route coming out of the backfield or, or even if you're in a slot position and, and the tight end, there's, there was a greater, uh, there was a greater distance for the, they, they couldn't cover both, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, we developed that play. First from underneath the center, off three steps, and then we did it out of the out of the shotgun. And uh, Leach and I would have constant arguments over whether you should run a shoot route or a swing route. <laughs> and and we've actually both been. It, 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 it's it so doesn't matter that that we actually have both liked both sides of the argument at different times. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> The uh, but the backside of that play was always double slant, okay. and and anytime they shifted the defense over and gave you the slant routes, or or if you got man coverage, you know you want to just throw the slant. Yeah. Um, the next question I was don't, asked. Don't overthink it. Would be my greatest advice. <laughs> well, that's that's good advice, Coach. Uh, the next question I was asked to ask you is, uh, what did you recognize? that made you implement geometry onto the field in the air raid? Was it talent deficiency, desire for a system? I, I just always liked geometry. And I liked taking plays, even before I developed this offense, I would take plays and uh, think about them in terms of the space of the whole field. Uh, it, we're talking about the, the late 70s and early 80s now when most defenses didn't defend the field, they just defended your formation. And I always wanted, I was constantly wanting to develop this offense. And so I was constantly drawing up concepts and plays and, and asking myself, how would this affect the field? And so, uh, you know, if you, if you read the perfect pass, he, Sam Gwen talks about how my ex-wife and my, uh, associates would run around, you know, they would see me drawing on napkins and tablecloths and stuff all the time. Well, that's what I was doing. And, and I just always thought of it with the idea that, uh, you should make them defend the whole field, yeah, not the formation. And so that's, that's how the geometry of the game, uh, to me came along. Okay. Um, the next question is, is kind of more of some issues. Um, a couple of the coaches in the area, when they run their their variation, the air raid, see a lot of either drop eight or match quarters are probably the two most common responses we get from defensive coordinators in our area. Um, yeah. How are the biggest ways you handle that? Obviously, I've heard you mention drop eight is run the ball. Um, but what, what other options for either drop eight or match quarters do you think is, are? Well, drop eight we've been seeing for, I don't know, probably no oh, I don't know since I, I think the first time we probably faced it was was uh, probably around 91 and that's when like the game I told you about we played we lost but we we threw it we were 61 to 86 yeah our, our running back caught 13 balls and we ran a lot of four verticals and just dinked it down to him you know so when they're going to run, if a team, if they're going to constantly drop eight on you, I think you have to, uh, you have to be very patient. You're, you just turned into the flip side of the coin of the wishbone and, and you're trying to make three and a half yards every time. And, and they're betting that you don't have enough patience to do that. And you got to prove to them that you do. Okay. And so you have to run the ball some and you have to dink it down and, doesn't mean you don't peek deep every time, 
because they may screw up. But your quarterback, you've got to really, really uh, impress upon him the importance of completions. And what we would do in practice is we would chart every ball that was thrown. And at the end of the day, the quarterback would get a numerical percentage, you know, how many completed. And, and the receivers, we would chart who caught the ball. So we did this for Pascal and we did it for team. And, and we would, uh, we'd post that in the locker room or show it to them. You know, we, every, we did that every day. They, we were, they were going to see, did they complete 80% of their balls every day? And, and we used to talk constantly about in the course of a game, and we were going to have a game where we completed 50 passes. And I'll never forget that the first time we did, it was actually at, at, at that Harding game and the backup quarterback was doing the charting and somewhere in the third quarter, he comes up to me, and goes, coach, we've done it. And I said, we've done what? He goes, we completed 50 balls. I said, well, that's good. We're staying, we're hanging in the game with it that, that way. Cause they were going to drop and they, they had a great middle linebacker. They could stop the run game, but he couldn't cover. So we just ran option routes off him and threw it to the running back. Um, and we ran a lot of mesh. We hit a lot of mesh routes against zone coverage. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the idea though. If they, if they're going to drop eight, you just have to be patient. Okay. And so you got to do things ahead of time. What, like I'm talking about with the practice charting and stuff like that to him, you, you got to implant in your quarterback's brain that not every game is going to be this downfield throw game. You know, some games you're going to have to let the backs do the job and, and you just got to, you got to make them throw it. Look deep, throw it short, look deep, throw it short. And you're going to do that about 10 times. And then maybe you get lucky and get one, somebody open deep, but people that are going to drop on you. That's, that's what you got to do. Okay. And then what, what about ma- match quarters? That's the other common response we see. Oh, we love playing that. Uh, the best thing you can do is go post route with Z and run sale. 90. That's okay. the best play. And, and we do that. Yeah. That'll, that's almost a check check for us if we get that all right if you think about it i mean you you run that sail route at 10 yards and it's a it's a bend out speed cut out basically is all it is and then you put the you put the uh you got a corner which usually playing outside technique and and you run the post route on him well that safety's in a heck of a bind yeah okay simple enough for me um, to, I, I got two more questions for you, Coach, and I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your day, and I appreciate your time. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, obviously, air, and you've mentioned this before, and a bunch of people mentioned this, air raid is a vertical and horizontal stretch. You're putting pressure on both sides, depending on what you're calling. Um, what do you say to coaches who say they don't have enough uh, speed to run that at the skill positions? Well, I, we got it from BYU. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> That's that's the same question as people would when I when I interviewed for the Kentucky job, they said, Do you think this will work up here? And it, you know, we get a lot of cold weather. I go, Well, Provo, Utah gets pretty cold. Yeah. <laughs> I said, You can do anything you want. You just gotta work at it. Uh no, nah, I've never thought that was a good excuse. Okay. Some enough for me. Um and then last question, because I'm curious, because I I grew up a big um June Jones and Hawaii fan. Um, yeah. I lived in Texas at the time, as we talked Me before, too. before off screen. Um, and so, so obviously, like the Hawaii game would be on at nine or ten at night every night. Yeah. Um, and you, they, Hawaii would be playing like Boise or some other school that out, out far west. And so I always loved watching that. And then you ended up working with June. Oh, what was it? I don't even know what year that was. Um, thirteen. It was thirteen. Two thousand thirteen. Yeah. And you guys kind of meshed the air raid and the run and shoot and and i've heard people call it like the star wars offense um yeah i it uh i wish i had gotten there a year earlier for garrett gilbert because garrett by the time i got there his confidence was pretty low he didn't have a very good junior year and then his senior year he had a great year but uh he got hurt he missed the last two games and we had didn't get to play with him so we lost him but um no, it was tremendous fun, and June and I, 
Jim and I have always been, we've just kind of followed each other around our whole careers. <laughs> Uh, the first time I met him, I was the offensive coordinator at UTEP, and he was the offensive coordinator at Hawaii in 1983. And we had a great game with him, and we we lost. I think it was like 15 to 15 to uh, 12 or something. But we drove the ball down the field at the end of the game. Had time for one more play from the five yard line. We we call a pass play, and the the quarterback hits our tight end between the between the numbers. And he did one of those painful drops that is almost like in slow motion, you know? And so we lose the game and we're sitting around the locker room crying and bemoaning our fate. And I look up and there's walks in this tall, good looking guy that, that, uh, comes in and he, he looks at our staff and he says, I just wanted to come tell you guys that y'all deserve to win that game. And y'all should keep your heads up. Cause that, that well, that's, that's as good as anybody had played us. And, uh, his, he, Dick Toomey was the head coach here in those days. and They had a great team. Um, but yeah, so we got to be friends after that. We were just friends. And when I was at Valdosta, he was at the Atlanta Falcons. When I went to New Mexico State, he was at Hawaii. And, you know, uh, I go to McMurray, he's at SMU. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it, you know, it's, it's in the there wasn't a lot of people throwing the ball. I wanted to talk to somebody that threw the ball like I wanted to throw the ball. It, it was a really small club. Yeah. In Texas, there was five high school coaches that were throwing the ball. I was one of them. And in college, or the pros, there probably wasn't that many, you know. And and so, Jim and I just started sharing ideas a long time ago. And I've always run go route as a part of our, you know, as part of our package, go and choice, as a way to move the pocket a little bit. Yeah, and we've had some great success with it through the years. Dustin D. Wall at Iowa Wesleyan was really great at it, um, and June always admired our crossers, you know, the mesh and the shallows and stuff. And so in 2013, he called me up and said, "Why don't you come over here and be my offense uh, passing game coordinator?" And uh, he said, "You don't have to coach anything; you know, just walk around, and tell everybody what to do." <laughs> tell me what to do so we put in mesh and i told him i, I said we're going to run mesh and uh j nobody really wanted to do it when i got there but jim did jim wanted to and so i put it in i showed him how to drill it and we played the first three games and we called it i think like 13 times and we kind of had this agreement. When I took the job, Jim said, I'm going to let you gonna call the, you can call the offense on the game day. And I knew that wasn't going to be true. <laughs> but <laughs> So we kind of had this, uh, he would call it. If he didn't feel like calling it, he'd let me call it, you know? Yeah. So we're playing Rutgers. And at the end of the first quarter, we're down 28 to nothing. <laughs> so the second quarter, he goes, well, I'm not doing any good. You call it. So I put us in trips and I called go, uh, stick and mesh and, and one run play. And I, I said, Garrett, that's, we're just going to do that and just line them up. Look at them. If you don't got it, look at me, I'll, I'll signal it to you. And that's, you know, we, they were pretty easy to read. They were playing that, what you were talking about a while ago, that quarters yeah. matchup stuff. And so I would just, you know, if they were back, we'd, we'd throw a go route and just throw the little flat, you know, if they were, if they were up, we would run mesh and, and, uh, <clears throat> we go down the field, boom, boom, boom. So at halftime, we're tied up 28, 28. We come out in the second half and the same thing happens. We're down by 28 again. <laughs> so he says, hey, we're going in the fourth quarter. He looks at me and he says, well, just do what you did before. <laughs> <laughs> So we did, and we got we got down, and we 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 had to go. We, our, our kicker missed an extra point, and uh, with the last drive we to tie it up, we actually had to go for two. You know. Yeah. So we had I ran mesh from the goal line, and Garrett Gilbert made the ESPN play of the day uh, because of the way we had drilled that thing and coached it and everything, and and, and because Garrett's so good. Um, and so we tied it up. And we went to overtime. We end up we end up losing triple overtime to them, but uh, 
it, it was an amazing deal. I think Garrett threw for 500 and something yards. Yeah. Ever. But after that, we go, I go in on Sunday, and Jim comes in the office and goes, damn, that mesh place is awesome. <laughs> so now he runs it all the day. He's got mesh with everything. Yeah. <laughs> He's running mesh off everything. Jesus. That's awesome, Coach. Well, I, I think that's a great way to end this is with that good story. Yeah. Coaches, that was another episode of the Gap Downbacker podcast. Uh, make sure you look below Coach uh, Mumi's uh, Twitter handles in the bio. Give him a follow. Um, also, information about the air raid certification for any of those of you who've not gotten it that are listening to this. Um, there's links below for you to check that out. Um, and thank you again, Coach Mumi. And uh, I wish hope everybody enjoys uh, and stays healthy.